Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So, um, yeah, welcome again, and thank you for your time you are spending with us. Uh, you did a workshop with us on spiritual care, and um, I would like uh, to put some questions regarding uh, to the workshop. Um, you said that spirituality has has been seen and still is seen with suspicion uh, by Muslims, influenced by modern reformist uh, movements who were critical against Sufism. So, um, is there a problem of bringing back spiritu spirituality to the center of Muslim life and how could we do this? Uh, should we try to rehabilitate Sufism or should we try to take practices like Tazkiyat to Nafs without mentioning Sufism? Mm -hmm. Yes, the reality of the um, modern age is that uh, both among, say, the, say the rigorist uh, uh, of Islam, the kind of uh, those who were rejecting traditional Islamic practices and schools of thought, as well as the reformist movements, there there was a lot of criticism of traditional Sufism, and what I believe is that. Uh, we ended up throwing out the baby with the bathwater. We threw out a lot of um, very, very useful uh, and very deep wisdom that's found in, in the, these texts and traditions. Now, the reality is the Muslim community is diverse. And if anyone is going to work in the field of religious leadership in the Muslim community, spiritual care, they have to begin from a position of accepting the diversity of the Muslim community. If they're going to come in and say, um, I, I absolutely reject this large segment of the Muslim community that practices Sufism or aspects of Sufism or draws on that as their strength, they shouldn't be in this, um, in this field because they won't be able to serve much of the community. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we, we can capitulate to this kind of attitude. We should have Muslim practitioners who are very diverse. We should have them from all of the different schools of thought of Islam, um, uh, all of the different legal schools, theological schools, so that we can serve the community. But they they all need to have an attitude of acceptance. It doesn't mean that you you um, dissolve the differences. Mm. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to uh, that you won't have you know some very serious disagreements about how to practice Islam, Islamic theology, but you have to at least have this view that all the people of Ahlul Qibla are Muslims mm -hmm. and they have the right to have their um, their own understanding of Islam, their own communities, and they have a right to be served. So for um, so we shouldn't you know try to dance around this and say, well, mm -hmm. we don't want these people may be sensitive about this term or that. Um, they, they have to learn, like we all have to learn, to accept people who are different. Um, so that's to begin with. But it is true that when we, when we look at uh, Islamic spirituality, Sufism, you know, where most of the, Sufism is where most of the discussions mm. of the idea of um, uh, purification of the heart, discipline of the ego, and what kind of actions need to be taken in order to elevate your, your spirit, you know? Mm -hmm. Purify your spirit and elevate your spirit. Uh, this is found traditionally and most, mostly in the text of Sufism mm -hmm. um, because that was the discipline that focused on these questions, just as the discipline of fiqh focused on the sharia, just as the discipline of... Um, Usul al-Din or Aqidah focused on theological problems. It, they were the special specialists mm -hmm. in this area. Mm -hmm. So we really need to go and, and understand these texts um, and take from them what is beneficial. Um, not in a superficial way. You mm -hmm. can't just go and you know pick a few things out. They really need to be studied mm -hmm. and explored and understood. And with that, uh, there's just such uh, many rich resources that then can be implemented. But of course, you know, what's important to understand is that they didn't, you know, for those scholars of spirituality who were exploring these concepts and these methods, uh, they weren't doing this apart from Islam. Mm -hmm. They were drawing from concepts in the Quran, uh, 
practices of the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and great Muslims who gave ex who who showed to us um, how to live these concepts. So it's perfectly possible for someone to also go back, you know, follow the same kind of um, chain of reasoning that they have mm -hmm. in terms of uh, spiritual care discipline of the ego back to the Quran and Sunnah and the example of, of great uh, righteous Muslims mm -hmm. throughout history and and then um, you know learn from that uh, as well without necessarily accepting the, the complete uh, discipline mm -hmm. or, or school of thought mm -hmm. that they come from yeah. Uh, yeah. you you yourself developed and directed the first uh, accredited graduate program for Muslim chaplains in America um, could you briefly outline the contents and the structure of this program and how does it integrate like uh, mm. the old wisdom of Sufism, for example? Well, this is a program that continues to develop because when I began it, um, the challenge was, there were many challenges. One of them was um, trying to work with the people who were actually already in the field, practicing mm -hmm. chaplains, those who were giving spiritual care, who wanted further education and themselves identified gaps in their education. And it's interesting because uh, we had two main types of students. We had, on the one hand, those who had been working in the field for a long time out of a love for humanity, a deep sense of service, a sense of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and wanting to help those who were poor, needy, who were poor in spirit also. Mm -hmm especially prisoners and jails and, uh, and other. So they, those people didn't have many resources at their disposal, but they had a love for people, a love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would continue to turn to the Quran for their inspiration mm -hmm. and had a lot of deep practical wisdom. But they themselves felt that they needed a deeper education in Islamic studies, mm -hmm. in understanding the um, Islamic sciences and, and disciplines. And then there were, we also had students who came from more traditional backgrounds who went to uh, schools like Darul Alum or something mm -hmm. like that, had a very traditional Islamic training, but really had very little practical wisdom, mm -hmm. very little experience of the world, um, uh, didn't have skills, the, the kind of skills of dealing with very complex play, uh, cases, and also the skill of... Um, you know, understanding their own their own responsibility as a spiritual practitioner. What are the professional mm -hmm. ethics? For example, one of the very important issues is establishing boundaries between you and the person that mm -hmm. you're counseling mm -hmm. so there isn't a violation. We know that when people are in a position of being cared for, um, being counseled, that an emotional bond can form and in fact, it's very easy for the person who's being counseled to, to develop feelings of love mm -hmm. and affection mm -hmm. for the, the one who's counseling them. This is very dangerous. Um, and so it's up to the, to the spiritual caregiver mm -hmm. to be very clear about his or her own ethics, guidelines, and how to maintain those professional boundaries so there isn't a violation of trust. So all of these issues we were looking at one, what, what do uh, spiritual caregivers need to know uh, about the Qur'an, about Sunnah? What kind of fiqh do they need to know? Beyond fiqh, what about ethics? Um, then second, uh, practical wisdom and, uh, in spiritual care. And the, this is where a lot of the um, knowledge from uh, cognitive behavioral mm -hmm. therapy, pastoral counseling, uh, these courses often for us, we had our Muslim students were in class with Christian students mm -hmm. because this is a kind of knowledge and skill base that is um, uh, that everyone can draw mm -hmm. on. It's neutral. It's not specifically Islamic. Now it is true that then we can we can look at uh, uh, Islamic spirituality to find related concepts or to supplement that material, enrich the material with, the wisdom of the Islamic tradition. But that's a wisdom that even the Christian students can benefit from because it's mm -hmm. really about mm -hmm. how do we understand the human being? How does the person deal with feelings of, of you know, sadness and loneliness, all of these things? And then the third area is this issue of professional religious ethics. Mm -hmm. 
really, un this is so important, disciplining yourself and understanding um, what, do, what do you do when you have power over someone? Mm -hmm. You didn't want to have power. That's not why you went into it. You went into it, inshallah, to serve people. But the reality is now you do have power. And this is a very dangerous position for anyone to be in personally. Mm -hmm. So to develop that, um, to study what professional ethics are, to learn that, and to practice it in a supervised setting. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the things we do is that our students, um, before they graduate, they spend uh, hundreds of hours mm -hmm. um, practicing uh, as spiritual caregivers, chaplains, under the supervision of a senior certified mm -hmm. person. Yeah. Um, in Germany, we have some uh, projects uh, in the field of uh, hospital care and um, uh, spiritual care and the jails as well. Uh, you mentioned one concept of communal spiritual care, which mm -hmm. sounded very interesting. Could you outline this concept? Yes. So most, uh, when we think of, of chaplains here, spiritual care, we think of the caregiver who's in an institution. Mm. So there are people who are stuck there. <coughs> in prison, they're stuck in the hospital, um, or uh, those who are in university, for example, away from home. So they're, they're not in a, they're displaced, or they're mm -hmm. not in a regular setting where their regular routines and social and family support is available. That's why they need a caregiver, a spiritual caregiver in that setting. But the reality is that today, uh, normal society is in a state of disconnection, a state of disruption. It's not as though people go home from the hospital these days and there's a very mm. strong supportive community for them. Many people have no family or their family's disconnected. Their neighbors, they don't know their neighbors. Um, you know, uh, someone graduates from university, maybe they move to another city where uh, they don't know anyone. For their job, they have they have to go far away. They meet some people, they make a few friends, but it's not the deep um, relationships, the deep committed bonds of support. Mm. Um, what you find is that many people look to the mosque mm. for this support, but th th there's problem with that in that one, most imams aren't trained in this area. <clears throat> most uh, mosques and Islamic centers don't provide supplemental spiritual care. They could, so they could hire in addition to the imam a spiritual mm -hmm. caregiver. But also, so many of the people can't even get to the mosque. Either physically they have a problem, disabled, um, bedridden, um, ill, you know, they're, they're undergoing some medical treatment. Um, mentally there may be a problem mm -hmm. because of their depression they can't even move up. Think of some women with postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. um, in a traditional Muslim society, you deliver a baby, friends, relative, family, they come, they put on the henna, they feed you, mm -hmm. they help you take care of the baby. In many of our societies, a woman has a baby, she sits at home mm -hmm. watching TV. So, you know, no, no wonder there's so much depression. And then there's, uh, there's also some spiritual problems, some spiritual obstacles to going and getting care in the seeking help in the mosque, even if someone is there capable of taking care of you. Mm -hmm. um, some people have been harmed and traumatized by religion itself. Mm -hmm. Think about uh, many of the refugees that are coming into our country who have been victims of sectarian wars, mm -hmm. where uh, people are using religious justifications for violence. And they come, do you think they're going to go to the mosque? Mm -hmm. The first place they're going to go to the mosque? They want to avoid religion. So what I believe we need is we need spiritual caregivers who are in the community, who are not sitting at a, at a desk or an mm -hmm. office waiting for people to come to them, but who are going out into the community. They could get referrals through a hotline, through mm -hmm. other different ways, but they actually are, are ones who are going like a visiting nurse or a visiting midwife, they're going into the homes. Mm -hmm. They're going into the, um, uh, the detention centers. 
their or, or the you know temporary refugee places. They're going. They have a list of women who have given birth, and they go and mm. they visit and they follow up, whether they're asked to or not, just mm. to have this mm. sense of connection and solidarity. Um, even things like in Chicago, where I used to live, um, it was really moved by the example of street chaplains. There are some Christian chaplains who their setting is the street, and they spend all all day walking in the underprivileged areas, talking to the homeless people, being with them, being available for young people who run away from home and are right on the streets, who are vulnerable to sexual exploitation, drugs, all of these things. So they are actually in the streets, riding the bus, walking around with people, and then are able to, first of all, be present for them as, as a as a, as a happy, comforting, loving presence, if they can do nothing else, at least to give them this mm. companionship and love. And in some cases, they're able to help improve their situation, make them referrals to different mm. agencies yeah. that may be able to help them. Yeah. I would love to see the Muslim community involved yeah. in this mm. because I think this is, this is a wonderful model and it's something that I feel is, is really... Um, the idea of being in transition is something that is, I believe, part of um, a spiritual kind of secret or core of Islam. Something I didn't talk about in the lecture yesterday, mm -hmm. but if we think about how Islam was founded, first of all, by, you know, Mecca's founded, as I said, by a woman who was in some ways a refugee, displaced, mm -hmm. right? We have, we have Hajar alayhi mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Then we have uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The first Muslims, a big uh, uh, a group of them, first have to make hijrah yeah. to Africa. Then the whole community has to make hijrah to Medina, and we see that that when the Prophet Muhammad sallam said, "Be in the world as if you are a traveler mm -hmm. or a wayfarer," mm -hmm. there's something about this idea of of moving, of being in transition, of being displaced that is, we think of it as a very bad thing and it's a big, deep struggle. But there's also something in it that allows us, that allows the mind, can allow the mind and the heart to really focus. Um, and so uh, it's very clear that in our time, we are not going to have less displacement yeah. than we do now. Every year it is increasing. Every year there are more climate disasters and climate refugees. Mm -hmm. Every year there are more wars. Um, every year there's a, another economic problem somewhere where people are fleeing that. So if we don't get ahead of this, um, we're going to become increasingly irrelevant. We're going mm -hmm. to be sitting in empty yeah. buildings mm -hmm. or empty offices waiting for people to come when all the people are out there mm -hmm. on the move. So we need to be out there on the move with yeah. them.